it this week, and we hope to have some film of that on the show next season. In the meantime, we've got some great footage to show you from last week's four divisional playoff games, and I'll be back with all of the best of last week's playoff action right after this message. There's a story about George Allen going around that as a boy he traded a six-month-old dog for two eight-year-old cats. Well, the cats George hangs out with now are a lot older than eight, a lot older. 49er coach Dick Nolan, on the other hand, has only two players acquired through trade. San Francisco built their team almost exclusively through the draft. Now, in San Francisco last Sunday, Nolan's kids met Allen's cats. It turned out to be quite a brawl. On a uniquely unpleasant day in the Bay Area, these San Franciscans and a national television audience witnessed a study in contrast. The 49ers made the playoffs for the second straight year because they became a team that shook off indecision and found an identity. Much of the credit belongs to Dick Nolan, an intense man who drafted well made a good offense better and built a young defense in his own image. The defense has made the difference in San Francisco. The Redskins, too, have become believers. But George Allen has traded away most of their draft choices in favor of veterans, many of whom he had in Los Angeles. But the Redskins won, and with Allen as coach and cheerleader, the Redskins made postseason competition for the first time since 1945. Under George Allen, the Redskin defense, which had been charitably described as pathetic, became a real good one. 49er running backs Kenny Willard, number 40, and Vic Washington, number 22, found out how good in the first quarter as they were denied running room. Quarterback John Brody, incomparable at finding open receivers, was forced in the pocket on one occasion and forced into incomplete passes on several others. The Skins definitely meant business, and the special teams forced the game's first big mistake. Steve Spurrier's third punt was blocked by John Jaqua, number 48, and the Redskins had the ball at San Francisco's 28-yard line. With the 49ers shutting off the run, quarterback Bill Kilmer began looking for tight end Jerry Smith, an all-pro candidate who's been hurt most of the season. Washington converted a crucial fourth down and in inches and scored the game's first touchdown on a pass from Kilmer to Jerry Smith. But the 49ers knew something about defense as well and the Redskins would not score another touchdown until late in the fourth quarter. With linebackers Frank Nunley, number 57, 
and Skip Vanderbunt, number 52, punishing those Redskin runners. The 49er offense was given ample opportunity to get back in the game. But with Vic Washington's 27-yard run, the only exception, the 49er offense looked listless. Brody's passes were missing open receivers, and San Francisco could manage only a field goal for the first half. While line coach Dick Stanfill analyzed what was going wrong with the 49er offense, the Redskins took advantage of another strength, their specialty teams. With the offense faltering, the Washington return team set about to win the game themselves. Ted Vactor returned a punt 47 yards late in the first half. And leading 10 to three, the Redskins threatened to blow the game wide open. With but seconds remaining in the half, Allen and Kilmer decided on a little razzle-dazzle to cross up the over-pursuing 49er defense. But Cedric Hardman, number 86, maintained his position and made the big play. A move made even more important as the Redskins' attempted field goal was blocked by Frank Nunley, and the score remained 10 to three Washington. Again, the 49er defense had held, and while Dick Nolan could find some solace in that, his offense was not scoring. All it would take now would be one mistake in the second half, and any George Allen team would laugh all the way home. During the regular season, the 49ers were nearly always a second-half team, often coming from behind, while the Redskins had the habit of hanging on to a lead for victory. As the Redskins found out, though, hanging on against the 49ers is like trying to make an omelet in a hurricane. You're bound to get egg on your face. If the 49ers needed anything, it was a visit from Santa Claus. However, Santa wasn't hanging in there too well. On instant replay, we can see that Santa just folded up in a clear case of what a good rush will do for you. In any case, if Santa needed some help, so did the 49ers as Speedy Duncan returned the second half kickoff 66 yards before Johnny Fuller saved the touchdown. Here is where the game changed its entire complexion. Nolan's defense again faced fourth down and inches, and again the Redskins gambled for it. Frank Nunley threw the play for a loss, and the 49ers took over. 
This play will be pondered for years because three snaps of the ball later, the 49er offense got very healthy. John Brody found Gene Washington all alone and 78 yards down the road, San Francisco became another team. In one almost unbelievable stroke, the Redskins were cursed. A repeat of the play shows the ideal combination of factors. Brody's tremendous fake. Pass protection coaches dream about. And a perfect pass to perhaps the best receiver in football today. And that's a pretty tough combination to beat, no matter how old your defenders are. The 49ers have had to pull off innumerable big plays in their pursuit of excellence, but it would take a large memory to conjure anything more dramatic in their history. Ironically, it was Gene's only catch of the day, but he didn't waste it. And George Allen's Redskins found themselves in a hole, even though the score was still tied. When Kilmer was able to work, he found his passes pressured and inaccurate. And a sense of the frustration San Francisco had experienced earlier crept into his game. Moments after Washington's touchdown, Kilmer made his only mistake. Safety Rosie Taylor, number 25, intercepted, and the 49ers open shop again at the Redskin 38. As might be expected, John Brody started throwing. He completed a third down pass to cantankerous Dick Witcher, number 88, who brought to the attention of the officials a personal foul on the Redskins' Mike Bass, number 41. With Santa finally coming through for him, Brody found Bob Windsor in the end zone, and the 49ers took a lead they never lost. But the Redskins hardly played possum. On the ensuing kickoff, Speedy Duncan roared back 67 yards, and that led to a Washington field goal by Kurt Knight. Offensively, Kilmer was attempting to exploit right cornerback Mike Simpson, number 38, who was playing for the injured Bruce Taylor. But Simpson, like the rest of the 49er defense, was not about to be had. The consistent second-half pressure exerted by San Francisco paid off when the special teams atoned for their poor kickoff coverage by recovering a bad snap in the end zone for a touchdown. Bob Hoskins, number 56, pounced on San Francisco's insurance, and the graffiti was pretty well on the wall. Bill Kilmer did engineer a fourth quarter dry that resulted in a touchdown to Larry Brown, but by then it was too late. Kilmer's last hope was smothered by Cedric Hardman. The 49ers had won 24 to 20. But the Redskins, and getting as far as they did, also won the respect of many people both in and out of football. The two quarterbacks had met as competitors and old friends, and both wished each other well. But for Dick Nolan, meeting the rugged Dallas Cowboys for the second straight year in the NFC Championship is not such a pleasant prospect. We'll have more exciting action on This Week in Pro Football right after this brief message.
In Cleveland, the Browns and the Baltimore Colts got together for their third postseason meeting since 1964. That year, the Browns shut out the Colts 27 to nothing to win the NFL title. But in 1968, the Colts won the NFL crown with a 34 nothing shutout that sent them on to the Super Bowl. Well, last Sunday, they met again for round number three. The curtain was drawn at Cleveland Municipal Stadium, setting for an AFC playoff drama starring the East Division Baltimore Colts and the Central Division Cleveland Browns. In this, his first year as Cleveland head coach, Nick Scorich led the Browns to the AFC Central Division title. The Browns entered the game with a five-game end of the season win streak. But to continue the streak, the Cleveland offense faced a tough task as it flexed its muscles against the AFC's best defense. The Colt defense set a club mark this season, allowing just 140 points to lead the conference, as well as allowing the fewest yards, both rushing and passing. On their way to the best second place finish, Don McCafferty had seen his Colts bested by the Browns 14 to 13. But that was in the second week of the season, and a fellow named John Unitas was just coming off an injury. But he's 100% now for the Browns-Colts rematch. To have any chance of denting the Colts defense, the team must establish a ground attack. And after Cleveland quarterback Bill Nelson used three running plays to get a first down, he went up top and hit wide receiver Fair Hooker. But the ball came out of Hooker's hooks, and Rex Kern, number 44, recovered his fumble at the Baltimore 12. The Browns have a tough defense, too. And they held and forced a punt, which the AFC's leading punt returner, Leroy Kelly, returned 48 yards. Kelly's great run set up a Don Cockcroft field goal try, but with another chance to take an early lead, he hit the upright. An illegal procedure penalty before the ball was snapped saved the Browns, but on Cockcroft's second try, the ball never reached the uprights as Bubba Smith blocked it. Browns had been inside the Colt 15 two times, but had yet to score. Johnny Unitas did not get such good field position. He started from his own eight, but with a combination of his play calling and passing accuracy, moved the Colts to the lead. On the 17-play, 92-yard drive, Unitas completed six of six passes to five different receivers and sent the 441st draft pick, Don Nottingham, on a ground assault. Nottingham, who was filling in for the injured Norm Bulash, rushed for 92 yards in the game and finished the drive from the one. Bill Nelson now faced a Colt defense that thrives on an early lead. And as Nelson tried to come back through the air, the Colt defense teed off. Nelson's first period pass to Hooker was the only pass Nelson would complete to a wide receiver the entire game. And when he tried to hit Hooker again, his hurried pass was intercepted by Rick Volk, number 21. Volk's 37-yard return set up Nottingham's second first-half touchdown. This time from seven yards out and a 14-0 first-half lead. The second half began with a series of uncharacteristic mishandlings by both teams.
Bo Scott, number 35, recovered his own fumble, but the Brown offense was still struggling. The Colts were not so lucky as number 81 Jack Gregory fought off his blocker and swiped the ball from Tom Matty, number 41. Browns moved from their 40 to the Colts 38, but gave the ball right back on a Nelson fumble. And now it was the Colts' turn again. From the Cleveland 48, United threw right into Ron Snydow's hands. Snydow lateral to Clarence Scott, number 22, and Scott ran to the Baltimore 30. A repeat shows that Snydow actually caught the ball on a rebound off his face mask. Lateral before he was tackled and then watch the fruits of all the labor. The first play after the turnover, a good run by Scott got Cleveland 17 yards closer. But the cold defense again refused to give up the touchdown. And Cockcroft kept his head down, followed through, and notched a 14-yard field goal. Cleveland was on the board for the first time, but the Colts came right back riding John Unitas' great right arm. Unitas connected on three of three, and the third to Ray Perkins, number 27, carried down to the Brown four. Baltimore is ready to put the game away. But on the play, Bob Vogel, number 72, was detected for holding. The Colts had to settle for a field goal and a 17-3 lead with a full quarter yet to go. The cold defense that had given up only 140 points all year was not about to give up 14 in one quarter. They held the Browns to 62 yards total offense in the second half and forced Nelson to resort to the rollout. But that didn't help either as Volk's second interception and return carried to the Cleveland 13. With another chance to put it away, the Colts' side of the field watched as Matty's fumble popped out and Walt Sumner, number 29, recovered. It did little good as three plays later, Nelson was again hurried and intercepted by Charlie Stooks. Duke's return set up a field goal that made the final 20 to three. The Colts now prepare for the AFC Championship against the Dolphins in sunny Miami. While for the Browns, the sun is set on their 1971 season. When Tino hit the home run against the Diamondbacks and Jeter won it. The fans were going nuts, the players were going nuts, the place just shook. And it was four frame, but that was a great game. That had to be the best Yankees game I ever saw. He just followed it pitch by pitch. Then beats it. Yankees Classics, the greatest Yankees games ever, only on the Yes Network. The New York Yankees and Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center proudly offer the Yankees Universe T-shirt. Buy yours at Yankees.com or the Stadium Store at Yankee Stadium. And all net proceeds go to Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center.
The Yankees Universe Fund makes a world of difference to kids at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. We'll be right back to this week in pro football following station identification. This is the Hughes Sports Network. In the second half of our show, you'll see the two Christmas games. First, you'll see how the Dallas Cowboys defeated the Minnesota Vikings at their own game and on their own field. Then you'll see a rather historic event as Don Shula's remarkable Miami Dolphins outlasted Hank Stram's frustrated Kansas City Chiefs in the longest game of pro football ever played, 82 minutes and 40 seconds. Now, those fellows had to be more than just a little bit tired after that one. We'll have more exciting action on this week in pro football right after this brief message. In Minnesota last week, the Vikings were hoping to make things very cold for the Dallas Cowboys. But the big day bloomed at 30 degrees, hardly freezing, and far too hot for the hardy Norsemen. In Bloomington, Minnesota, the Vikings prepared to meet the Dallas Cowboys for the seventh time. The Cowboys had been victors in the first five contests. But in the sixth in 1970, the Vikes bombed Dallas 54 to 13. As usual, defense had been the instrument of victory for Minnesota. But this sixth consecutive playoff appearance for Tom Landry featured the Cowboys as the NFL's highest scoring team due to a seven game hot hand held by new quarterback Roger Staubach. The Vikings too had a new quarterback, their punter Bob Lee. But Granite installed Lee as a starter ahead of both Gary Coazzo and Norm Sneed in order to prime what some called Minnesota's pop gun offense. But the pop gun misfired the first time the Vikings had the ball. Dave Osborne fumbled. Jethro Pugh recovered for Dallas, and a valuable gift was given and received. Dwayne Thomas gained one yard and two carries, and then Roger Staubach stepped back and hit Bob Hayes for 18 yards to the Minnesota 22-yard line. But there, the people eaters did what seems to come naturally. Number 88, Alan Page, wrecked Staubach attempting to pass almost causing a redeeming turnover. And when Staubach scrambled out of the pocket on third and 14, number 70, Jim Marshall, nailed him short of the first down. There had been preseason rumors that the mighty Marshall could no longer hold up his end for the purple, but this season and this game were to be among his very best. Marshall's punishing play forced Dallas to settle for a field goal and a three-point lead.
the start of the second period, when the Vikings could not move out of their own territory, Bob Lee's punt occasion, the first disputed call of the game. The Vikings claimed that the rolling number 37, Isaac Thomas, deflected the bouncing ball. The officials said not so. It was not a popular call in Minnesota, for it denied the Vikings at least a recovery at the Dallas 8, and perhaps the break they needed to springboard them over the Cowboys. A repeat of that play reveals, if nothing else, that it was a very close call. Minnesota's next possession produced the game's second dispute. On third down, Lee passed to Jim Lindsay in the flat. Lindsay's advance would have sustained Minnesota's drive inside the Dallas 10. But the ball was ruled trapped and the Vikings had to settle for a game time field goal by Fred Cox. The Dallas offense remained stifled and the Vikings regained the ball at their own 20. On third down, Lee caught Bob Grimm free on a fly upfield and Grimm completed a 49 yard play squirming inside the Cowboy 30. But a scoring opportunity was dissipated by the Vikings and gained by Dallas when Bob Lee passed to soft-fingered Chuck Howley instead of Dave Osborne. Number 54 Howley charged into field goal range. With barely a minute remaining in the half, Mike Clark drilled a 44-yarder, giving Dallas the advantage. Thanks to Halley's big play, six to three. But the Vikings still had another opportunity to squander before the gun. Number 26, Clint Jones, made a magnificent return of the ensuing kickoff. And the Vikings were in business with 54 seconds remaining. A drop pass by Dave Osborne and a sweet play at the goal line by Cowboys Mel Renfro left it again up to Fred Cox. Fred Cox's toe had remained steadfast and true for 126 consecutive NFL games. But this second attempt went wide from the 42 and the half ended with Dallas still leading 6-3. Bud Grant restated his confident belief that young Bob Lee was a match for the Dallas Doomsday defense. When at the beginning of the third period, Lee's finger remained on the trigger of the pop gun offense. And once again, the pop gun was instituted with a misfire. Lee's floater intended for Bob Grimm was picked off by Cliff Harris and returned to the Minnesota 13 yard line. From their stallback attack, the strength of the Vikings defense just as the Cowboy opponents will try to keep the great tackle Bob Lilly in his place by running straight at him, Stoback attacked the cat-footed pursuer Allen Page. The middle gaped open and Dwayne Thomas honey-footed into the cornucopia, as they say. A repeat serves to treat the eye to the grace of a great running back, number 33, Dwayne Thomas. With a score of 13 to three, Charlie West returned the Dallas kickoff 51 yards to the Cowboy 42 yard line. But three plays netted only three yards and Fred Cox's 46 yard field goal try hit the crossbar and fell to the ground without impact. Then Dallas began two series of downs that controlled the ball and the game. In the first series, Staubach established field position, passing to Mike Ditka.
When subsequent plays fail, the Cowboys relinquished the football. But the doomsday defense reclaimed it. Stallback rewarded them with a 30-yard key third down pass to Lance Allworth. Stallback continued the drive, hitting Hill for a 10-yard gain. Then he found Bob Hayes lonely in the end zone, and Dallas held a commanding 20-3 hammer over the Vikings. From that point on, with 13-22 elapsed in the third period, the Dallas offense did not gain a first down in the face of pro football's royal proud purple defense. Time and again, Dallas's superback Dwayne Thomas drove into the crush to no gain. And in the beginning of the fourth quarter, the once burned Allen Page made Staubach pay. Bursting over his tormentors, Page bulldogged Staubach to earth in the end zone, scoring football's most humiliating point, a safety. It was small compensation for Page, his team trailing now 20 to five, but it is fitting that he should be so highlighted, for this was perhaps Allen Page's greatest game in a string of unbelievable performances by the game's greatest defensive tackle. At this point, Gary Cuazzo entered the game, replacing Bob Lee. The Vikings began the first of three goalward thrusts. The first was still when Cuazzo's pass leaked through the hands of Bob Grimm and into the hands of the Cowboys' Leroy Jordan. But the Cowboys could not gain a first down, and Cuazzo continued his bombing. Returning to the short middle patterns where he had first found success, Cuazzo hits Stu Voigt. Cuazzo connected with Voigt again and again, at last in the end zone capping Minnesota's quarter-long desperation drive with 2.08 remaining. The Dallas offense could not exhaust the clock, and once again, the doomsday defense stood at bay. But Cuazzo's last, most desperate pass was intercepted by Herb Adderley. And Dallas won this seventh and most important meeting between two superb teams, 20 to 13. And in Minnesota this Christmas day, it was not a jubilant throng of fans that dismantled the goalposts. The job was done by workmen after a long pro season at Metropolitan Stadium.
In the AFC playoffs last week, the Kansas City Chiefs and the Miami Dolphins hooked up in a duel that will have the armchair quarterbacks talking in their sleep for a long, long time to come. The 50,000 fans who paid their way into Kansas City's municipal stadium really got their money's worth. It was a football fanatic's dream. The Kansas City Chiefs and Miami Dolphins engaged in the longest pro football game ever played, a contest that lasted for three hours and 21 minutes. In the first quarter, there was no indication of the marathon to follow as Kansas City used number 14, Ed Podolak, to set up a Jan Stenerud field goal for a 3-0 lead. With his ground game unable to move, Miami's Bob Greasy, number 12, tried to rally the Dolphins with passes to number 42, Paul Warfield. With Kansas City concentrating on Warfield, Greasy tried to hit his tight end. But number 63, Willie Lanier, picked off the pass. Turning the ball over to Lynn Dawson is like tipping your hand to a card shark. And Dawson came up with aces as he hit workhorse Ed Podolak for a touchdown and a 10 to nothing first quarter lead. But the Dolphins made it to the playoffs on their ability to fight back. And number 42, Paul Warfield, has been a key performer in Miami's title run. The Chiefs were shutting down the Dolphins' feared running game, and Greasy was often forced to throw. Greasy's gift for scrambling, plus his receiver's ability to improvise on broken plays, make the Dolphins' air game even more dangerous. Greasy's passing led to the first Miami touchdown, a one-yard smash by number 39, Larry Zonka. That made the score 10-7 Chiefs. The man Lynn Dawson called on when he needed big yardage was Ed Podolak, who enjoyed his greatest day as a pro. But on the next play, Dawson fooled almost everyone as he made three backfield fakes. One man not fooled by Dawson's sleight of hand was number 45, Curtis Johnson. We ended the Chiefs' drive with an interception. After Miami failed to move, the Chiefs regained the ball, and the long striding of Ed Podolak was again Kansas City's main weapon. Although Podolak drove the Chiefs within scoring range, Kansas City failed to connect, as Jan Stenerud missed a 29-yard field goal attempt. Stenerud had just been chosen for the Pro Bowl over Miami's Garo Yaprimian. The ill-fated Stenerud would have gladly traded his all-star selection for a one-way ticket to Norway had he known what misfortune awaited him. The next time Kansas City had the ball, a mistake again cost them dearly. Ed Podolak fumbled, and number 40 Dick Anderson recovered for Miami. With less than two minutes remaining in the half, the Dolphins were given another chance. After Bob Greasy failed to connect on passes, Garo Yaprimian booted a 14-yard field goal to tie the score at 10-all. In the second half, Lynn Dawson decided to test his skill against the Miami secondary. A pass to number 89, Otis Taylor, and a lateral to number 14, Ed Podolak, showed that the Chiefs could move against the Dolphins. Although a penalty reduced the game, the versatile Kansas City attack picked up more yardage as number 35 Jim Otis improvised for a gain to the Miami one-yard line. Again, Otis got the call, and again, he paid dividends as he put Kansas City back on top 17-10. The passing ability of Bob Greasy gives Miami a big play surprise 
that can quickly wipe out a lead. The Dolphins used a greasy to Warfield pass to set up a one yard touchdown by number 21, Jim Kick, that nodded the score at 17 all. The battle had not yet produced a victor, and after three quarters, the guns were far from silent. At the end of three quarters, two of football's finest teams had battled to a tie. Who could have foreseen that the outcome would be decided by a ski jumper from Norway, and much later, a tie maker from the island of Cyprus? In the fourth quarter, the Dolphins recovered a fumble and turned the ball over to Bob Greasy, who was facing one of his toughest tests. On third down and eight, Greasy again came up with a big play. Greasy was brought down hard, and it was apparent that he was in pain. The gutty quarterback was playing with an injured left shoulder. But Greasy obviously feels that his playing with pain will be soothed by a share of the Super Bowl money. Miami's efforts came to an end when linebacker Jim Lynch, number 51, picked off a misdirected Greasy pigskin. The defense had again given the Chiefs a big break, and Lynn Dawson was determined to untie the tie. A short pass to Willie Frazier, number 83, set Miami up for a bomb from Dawson to number 17, Elmo Wright. Although Elmo failed to score, the rookie felt he was close enough to show off his touchdown strut in the end zone. The 63-yard pass play set up a go-ahead score for Kansas City as Ed Podolak's second touchdown put the Chiefs in front 24-17. There were just seven minutes left in the game, but it was time enough for another remarkable rally by the amazing Dolphins. Paul Warfield hauled in seven passes for 140 yards, but his receptions on this drive were the most important as they led to a game-tying touchdown. Greasy's razor-sharp passing took Miami to the Kansas City five-yard line. And with time running out, Greasy coolly rolled to his right and found tight end Marv Fleming for the touchdown that tied the score. For 
With a little over a minute left, it looked like the tie would hold. But Ed Podolak had not yet put the final touches on a glittering performance. A former college quarterback from Iowa scorched the field for 78 yards and almost went all the way. With the ball in the Miami 22, the Chiefs decided to run out the clock and try to set up a game-winning field goal by Jan Stenerud, one of the most accurate field goal kickers in the game. 50,000 fans and millions more watching on TV glued their eyes to the former ski jumper from Norway. 32 yards separated Stenerud from fame or infamy. Incredibly, Stenerud misfired, and Miami took over with a score still tied. The Dolphins failed to run out the clock and were forced to punt with seven seconds left. Time ran out as Dennis Holman made a fair catch. Here, the Chiefs decided not to attempt a free kick that would have had to travel 68 yards and could have been returned by Miami. Now the game went into overtime. The Chiefs won the toss and decided to receive. Miami tried to keep the ball away from Ed Podolak, but one way or another, he was destined to carry the ball. Kansas City advanced the ball to the Miami 35, where Jan Stinnerud had a chance to redeem himself. But Nick Bonacani blocked the kick and breathed life into the Dolphins. On Miami's first series in the overtime, the chief defense seemed destined to crush the magical antics of Bob Greasy. After Kansas City again failed to score, Greasy battled a tough chief defense, but the drive came to an end on the Kansas City 45. On fourth down, Garrow Yaprimian tried a 52-yard field goal, but his kick fell short and the marathon continued. Now it was Len Dawson's turn to see if the scoreboard still worked. On third and five at midfield, Dawson tried to hit Elmo Wright, but instead found Miami's Jake Scott as the seconds ticked away and the game went into a second overtime. The Miami ground game had been held in check for most of the day, but burly Larry Zonka, number 39, finally broke a big one to set up the game-winning field goal. Two giants of the gridiron had battled for over three hours, but the burden of victory rested with a five-foot-seven-inch place kicker from Cyprus. Darryl Yaprimian met that test. Another view of the game-winning field goal shows that Yaprimian knew it was good as soon as he kicked it. The glory that had eluded Jan Stinnerud descended on a man who led the NFL in scoring, but failed to earn a berth on the Pro Bowl team. For a happy Darryl Yaprimian, one Super Bowl will mean more than a million Pro Bowls. And only the fourth sudden death overtime ever played, Don Shula's young team had become an unforgettable part of pro football's rich history. Well, football fans will be rehashing that one for many decades to come, I'm sure of that. Now it's time for Pat Summerall and I to make our final picks. And since Pat isn't here, I guess I'll, well, Pat, I'll make the picks for you. Let's see, San Francisco at Dallas, you've been partial to the Bay Area boys all year long. You get San Francisco, and I'll go with the Dallas Cowboys, a team that certainly found itself both on offense and defense. Baltimore at Miami, I'm partial to the Fun and Sun boys. I'll go with Shula's Miami Dolphins, and you get the tough Baltimore Colts. I'll also take the Dallas Cowboys to go all the way and win the Super Bowl. And Pat Summerall, I'm gonna give you Buffalo. At any rate, we won't be back next week to show you what happens, but.